With the advent of Web 1.0 in the early 90s, the world changed in a way few could have predicted. But for at least a decade before that, a handful of those prescient few had already been wandering around the ever-growing data sphere and left footprints in the infoscape for us to follow. Welcome to the Weirdnet. Information is said to be indestructible, and since the entirety of the internet is pure information, it stands to reason that everything we see and do online is, generally, recorded for all time in some form or another. Once we put our information online, we give it up to the data sphere, and from there it can be used by anyone, however they see fit, and not always for positive reasons. Truth be told, if we look at the internet as a reflection of the human psyche, then it demonstrates how truly fucked up we can be, but also how much positive potential we have as a species. Every time we post, anywhere online, we leave a trace of ourselves as archived by sites and servers across the globe. These digital snapshots are providing increasing amounts of information as we walk across the infoscape. Not merely footprints, but potentially the means by which to identify you and market products directly to you based on your online behaviours. For the moment though, and for the purposes of this video, I want to focus on those mundane digital snapshots of everyday life. The Facebook posts, the forum rants and the chat logs. Those little glimpses into the minds of people like you and I that capture a moment in time and space. Many leave behind unexpected gold in the ash of thought as they express themselves online. But just as many, if not more, leave behind steaming turds and graffiti. For the most part, personal online interaction is fairly innocent, and most people stick to their social media, rarely venturing further than their familiar few sites. We share our stories, communicate with friends and family, upload content, and generally live much of our lives in these spaces, sometimes more involved with digital representations than the actual world around us. It's from these spaces that a more true reflection of the everyday comes, warts and all, with the occasional flash of brilliance. Whether it's a hilarious tweet from some random user, or the crowdfunding of a homeless shelter, we often overlook the positive in favour of the negative, and neglect the mundane miracle of our interconnection and the good things that can come from it. What may surprise many though is that this interconnectivity, which we now take for granted, predates Web 1.0 by over a decade. Now, obviously we could trace it back to DARPA and all that, but in terms of people like ourselves, the average consumer, the infrastructure of the internet became available as early as 1978. While most of us were still attacking the solid rubber keys of a ZX Spectrum with a hammer and chisel and copying games from the local library, some were already hooking up their home computers to their telephones and communicating with people halfway around the world. As we wrestled with blocky characters on an old tube TV, others were sharing media in a brand new way and participating in the birth of a whole new phenomena. While there's evidence to suggest that the use of the now defunct bulletin board system, or BBS, dates back to the early 1970s, the first real example outside of academic or military use occurs in Chicago, Illinois, during the infamous Great Blizzard of 1978. The CBBS system handled over 250,000 connections during its lifetime and would have provided a massive service to the people of Chicago during a difficult time. The CBBS would become the OG of bulletin boards and its usage during the blizzards led to February the 16th, the day the system came to life in 1978, being declared BBS Day by the mayor of the city in 2003. From 1978 till around 1996, bulletin boards and eventually Usenet groups gradually took over the fledgling world of online communication. Technology grew from bulky acoustic couplers attached to telephone handsets to more streamlined external devices capable of breakneck connection speeds of up to 14.4 kilobits per second. 
As access to personal computers became increasingly common, more and more people would begin connecting to, at first only local, but eventually national and even worldwide bulletin boards, where they could exchange new information with complete strangers, find friendship, even partnership, and experience a whole new form of communication for the first time. The early internet grew from a weird alchemy of academia, intelligence agencies and cyberpunks, developing into a strange informational ether, supported and fed by the ever-expanding technology through which we access it. Yet, while transfer speeds have increased and the hardware has improved, it's still the same fucking people using it as it was 20 years ago. We haven't progressed that much in the evolutionary sense, so it's still the same fingers poking at keys and the same projectile vomiting of opinions whether it's BBS or YouTube. Just because we can now do it in 4K doesn't mean we've necessarily moved on from being the mid-80s kid, running up his parents' phone bill and trying to download low-res porn pics, only to get completely enraged when grandma calls, just as he's getting to the good bit. In other words, the ways in which we behave online now aren't all that much different to the way we've been using the internet since its earliest days. It's not like a hundred years has passed, we're talking less than 40 years here, which, in terms of human development, is barely the blink of an eye. While the original interface was basic, it wasn't long before creative users found ways to use text symbols to create entirely new styles of art such as ASC2 and ANSI. With minuscule file sizes in the byte and kilobyte range, we gradually figured out ways to communicate increasing amounts of information in as little space as possible, giving rise to such still utilised online languages as Leet Speak. Many of the modern day abbreviations we take for granted nowadays have their origins during this time, such as LOL, LOL, which itself was coined on a Canadian BBS called Viewline in the 1980s, and for which Canada still owes the world an apology. But anyway, I digress as usual. From humble beginnings as what was basically a digital version of the classified ad section, the internet grew from a stumbling, lurching infant to an awkward, angry teenager, stumbling over its words and talking a language unknown to its parents. By the time Web 1.0 exploded, BBS and Usenet were effectively over for most of the Western world, only frequented by the diehards and those feeling nostalgic for a simpler time. After 1996, only places like China and Taiwan still utilised the old school telnet systems to access the bulletin boards. Over a decade of communication would eventually be left, abandoned but still accessible like some sort of etheric record, as the administrators upgraded to their own websites, forums and blogs. Others abandoned their servers and took to simply joining their BBS and Usenet friends on other sites, leaving a trail of informational breadcrumbs for those looking to explore the past. Now, as I said at the start of the video, information is considered to be indestructible, so unless the person posting to the BBS or whatever had deliberately marked the material to nuke, as they called it, it would usually be automatically archived and stored for future reference or search. Given the file sizes involved, especially pre-1990, entire prolonged threads of conversation could be stored as files as small as a few megabytes. Even with the addition of images in the later stages, since GIFs or GIFs also have their roots in Usenet groups in pre-Web 1.0 times, files not much larger than a Word document today would allow for a considerable amount of information to be stored. While much would have been lost over time, a huge amount of content remains and has been salvaged, curated and indexed. Many sites exist nowadays that give us access to the information pulled from the old message boards and user groups, but it's with the first of them all that we find the inspiration for the subject of this video. In 1995, just as BBS and Usenet peaked and before they began their decline, a site was launched called Deja News which offered archives of existing forums in a unique, searchable format. It was the first of its kind and allowed easier access to over a decade's worth of material, ranging from the obvious areas of interest to the most obscure fandoms you could imagine. 
After six years in business, Deja News was bought out by Google and the content became subsumed within Google Groups. Over time, other sites such as fastusenet.org and archive.org grew to offer similar but sometimes vastly improved services. However, Deja News laid the groundwork for what was to come. The use of BBS and related technologies naturally dwindled as newer, faster and more reliable forms of communication became available. But those footprints would still remain, captured from all over the internet and never to be forgotten. Just as it had slowly, organically grown from a niche technology to a worldwide phenomenon, so sites like Usenet would gradually dissolve into the infosphere, existing merely as a window into the past rather than a living, breathing entity in itself. As is often the case, a certain nostalgia grew around BBS and the like fairly quickly, and some tried to emulate the GUI style using more modern programming languages. As is also often the case, these reproductions lacked the warmth and familiar feel of their inspirations, only ever really providing an unsatisfying facsimile at best. While the basic form used on BBS had evolved into the modern day message board, some still craved the stripped back approach and the gap was filled for a while by places like the aforementioned Google Groups, as well as Yahoo and a host of other big name service providers. Other sites such as Archive and specifically Deja News, FastUseNet.org and TextFiles.com simply made the automatically archived material available for those craving the nostalgia hit and continue to do so today. That nostalgia is something evident over the last few years, especially online and in the media. There's a renewed love for the fuzzy, warm, crackling images of the VCR, the pink glow of a neon sign, and the analog synthesizer sounds of our childhood. Programs such as Stranger Things and weird underground musical genres such as Vaporwave all reflect this current trend, and for some, the idea of the old BBS or even just an old rubber keyed 48k home computer invokes a soothing, familiar feeling within us. It was this aesthetic, along with a fascination for network culture, that would influence an LA-based artist called Daniel Wren to launch the website that forms the basis of this video. In 2015, Wren came into possession of over 100 gigabytes worth of source material from what remained of Deja News. With archives dating back from 1980 until 1994, the material provided a unique look into the minds of people at the time often at their most mundane, but occasionally seeming to show incredible foresight in what was to become of the internet as we know it. Given the file sizes of the time, we're talking about around 100 million individual messages spread over the course of 14 years and touching on everything from Tron to whether or not America should pull out of Vietnam. In short, Wren's archives give us access to an entire cross-section of the early internet that would have otherwise been ignored. Daniel Wren, a graduate in visual arts from UC San Diego, had been involved with many different artistic projects prior to launching www.text.org, pronounced webtext.org. But it would be here that he would gain the most attention and provide a genuinely unique and fascinating insight into our digital past. Through using basic JavaScripting, he created an automated program to extract 140 character excerpts from his archived content and then send it via Twitter, Tumblr and Facebook. With a main website that mimicked the early 90s Apple Mag layout, Ren showed the content he tweeted in a scrolling command prompt style black box with, as with the other posts, the identity of the OP redacted. On the site, he also offered direct links to the original images, many of which are near identical to the allegedly dead internet-originated vaporwave style, so common and so commonly mocked for being shite. All in all, web text offers a unique glimpse into the past, all framed by the appropriate lo-fi aesthetic and still showing old-school alt-code text that only the most leaked would use nowadays. The accounts seem to post more sporadically these days, with only one recent tweet, but hopefully Daniel will find the time to get a reposting. 
The actual script is available on GitHub, so no doubt someone else could give it a try, adjust the parameters and see what comes out. No matter what though, Webtext was the first one to repost this relatively ancient material in a more modern, up-to-date way, utilising social media to share these little fragments of memory to a whole new audience. Through combining the computer aesthetic with an exploration of early networking culture, Daniel Loren has produced a unique piece of work that allows us to see both how little and paradoxically how much we've changed as individuals. But it's not all negative, obviously. There are some gems in there that'll make you laugh and some optimistic speculation on where we're headed. As the content of webtext.org shows, early internet users weren't just nerds or academics. They were the everyday consumer, but the ones who'd bravely stepped out into this new digital frontier and, in many cases, still had the arrows in their backs as proof. Webtext can serve as a reminder that, well, we're all arseholes, or at least have the potential to be, but also generally pretty compassionate, empathetic and understanding if we just stop and remove all the bullshit for the picture. Oh, and uh, for the record, if you're sitting there thinking, ah, but, but I'm not an arsehole, I'm never an arsehole to anybody, then I offer you this potentially life-changing piece of advice. I hear. We all are, and have the capacity to be one, so accept it and move on, you'll be happier, seriously. Anyway, I'm going off on tangents here as usual, back to Daniel Loren. What made Daniel particularly suited to this project was the fact that he, as a 10 year old kid, had actually run his own BBS system from 1989 until 1995, so he was intimately familiar with the subject matter. He used to source and curate art packs and demo seed materials from other, more distant bulletin boards and made them available locally. This hands-on, I was there knowledge of the software involved made his execution of the project all the more real and genuine, invoking that same feeling in others in the way that only real art can. With his archive of material from BBS, gopher sites, chat logs and Usenet, he was able to create an experience that takes you back to the earliest days of the internet and shows just how far we've come from the humble bulletin board system. Daniel's website, danielwren.com, offers a brief biography of the artist and links to his more recent works such as the LA Game Space and the humanitarian efforts of the Play Power Project in providing third world children with basic computing equipment. As I've said, his I was there experience of the aesthetic he presents with webtext.org gives it far more weight and makes it a much more interesting thing all round than just idly searching archive records. He does the work of selecting the materials and posts it, providing a little flash of nostalgia for many through his social media accounts. All in all, I find Webtext to be an intriguing and weird net worthy place to go for something unique and genuinely retro in this age of ever morphing information and technology. Daniel Wren has done, in my opinion, a great job in presenting this project and I encourage you all to go and check it out and follow the Webtext account on all social media and support the work of a passionate artist. I think I've probably gushed enough in this video, so it'll be clear that this is a project I really enjoy for all sorts of reasons. It's easy to become jaded or think that you're the only person who's going through shit, but sometimes a random line of text from the past can remind you that no, you're not unique in experiencing this and yes, things will change regardless of what you do. Through webtext.org, we can see how we keep repeating these same cycles of behaviours. We can see our hopefulness for change and our simultaneous despair at an ever-changing, barely understandable world seemingly being drawn into increasing chaos. The past has much to teach us, and even an innocent art project like Webtext could potentially give someone that flash of recognition that they're not alone, and that people have been through this before. In 20 years, people will be reading our tweets, our social media posts, and watching, listening to, or reading the content we created and thinking, look at those idiots, imagine believing that? 
just as we do today, the real-life tales of even the recent past. Technology is developing at speeds never before seen, and development itself appears to have some sort of fractal aspect to it which, given the frequency of current discoveries in science, would suggest that we'll see things progress even more rapidly. In other words, major advancements won't take hundreds of years anymore, or even decades. Just look at the content of webtext.org. Would the you of 1987 have had any clue that you'd be able to produce videos, upload them on a site for free, and tell other people about stuff that you found interesting and have a potential audience of millions? The seven-year-old me would have thought you were mental, or would have expected the words van or puppies to be mentioned, but basically, no, I wouldn't have believed it. In 30 years, we've made so many massive leaps in science and technology, but the real hardware, the human body and nervous system itself, hasn't yet caught up. But that's another story for another time and another channel I'll be launching in the new year. For the moment though, thank you for watching The Weird Net. Please like and subscribe on here and also feel free to follow me on Twitter and GabAI at The Weird Net for more nonsense from me and updates on any new material. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I look forward to hearing from you in the comments below. Take care of yourselves and thank you once again. Until next time, keep it weird.